Hi, Kendra. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Gabe, and I'm the founder and co-president here at BeachLex. Uh, and I'm Jacob, the vice president here at BeachLex. Uh, we are both students at Hoffington High School. And uh, we are an organization dedicated to providing knowledge and promoting awareness for ocean creatures as well as conservation. And we know that you are in the process of getting a marine biology degree at BYU. And we just wanted to ask you a few questions about your area of study as well as some other conservation topics. So let's get started. Um, so can you start by just uh, introducing yourself? Uh, you, you can uh, tell us about your educational or personal background. Yeah, so my name is Kendra Nelson. I am from Arizona. So I grew up my almost my whole life in Arizona. And now I live on the North Shore of Oahu, studying marine biology at Hawaii. I work with um, my university as a research and lab assistant, as well as a teaching assistant. And then I also work with One Ocean Diving here on the North Shore, and I work with PNW Protectors in Washington State. That's really cool. Um, why are you passionate about marine biology? So um, I've never grown up really near the ocean, but I grew up going to SeaWorld a lot. My family went to SeaWorld San Antonio up until I was five or six and then we moved to Arizona, and then we would spend um, at least once a year, a couple times going to SeaWorld of San Diego. So I spent most of my life wanting to be a SeaWorld trainer with the killer whales, um, but then I went to university and fell in love with um, research and conservation work rather than just training and working with animals. Um, and so, yeah, then while I was here, I just fell in love with a lot of different animals and different um, conservation work, and I just changed. Nice. Um, so what, which animals do you mainly dedicate your efforts to, and what are some of the biggest threats that each of them faces? Yeah, so I spend um, the majority of my efforts um, towards killer whales and specifically the southern residents. Um, in the Salish Sea in Washington, Canada. And the biggest threats that they mainly face is that their food source is depleting. So they eat, um, they eat several different species of fish, but their biggest um, source of food is the Chinook salmon, which um, their populations are decreasing due to salmon fish farms, but also there are dams that block the rivers that they would normally travel to, to spawn. So it just prevents a lot of spawns being able to get back into the sea every year. So their populations are just shrinking. And then here in Hawaii, I work with shark conservation. And so sharks face a lot. Um, there's overfishing is a problem with bycatch. And then there is like the shark fin industry. And that is another issue. Um, there's a lot of minor stuff too, just like the general um, dislike towards sharks doesn't help their case either. Um, we can raise awareness a lot about what sharks are facing and people tend to just be like, eh, it's a shark. Even I used to be scared of sharks and I had that view when high school. I was like, oh, they're sharks. I don't care if they all die. Um, but now I do. And I understand that that is um, a very uneducated statement about the ocean's ecosystem. Uh, yeah, that's really important. We've seen all of your um, videos and you're doing a great job promoting awareness for them. Um, so you specialize in invertebrates, uh, which face major threats from humans and destroy their habitat, like climate change. Um, so how can we tailor certain efforts to protect their lifestyle? So yeah, um, coral is what like the biggest one that faces um, like a direct threat to climate change that they are dying off due to that. And some other invertebrate species will actually boom due to climate change, but then that isn't a good thing. Like squid and jellyfish will see population booms and then they'll die off super rapidly um, or won't be able to be maintained and they'll kind of sniff out other species. Um, but so yeah, climate change is just, it impacts physical and chemical properties of our oceans. And the biggest thing we can really do against that at this point is to vote and advocate for climate action. There are personal things we can do, of course. Um, going meatless is really helpful because of the meat and not every day if you don't want to, but at least once a week. Um, or once a meal, maybe once a day, um, just to the emissions that are caused by um, the meat industry, then there's going plastic free, using reef safe sun sunscreen, um, maybe switching to electric 
appliances instead. Um, all those are great, but in terms of pushing for like mass reform and actual um, action for the earth, voting and advocating is one of the best things we can do. Uh, yeah, I think definitely uh, preventing climate changes that would definitely save a lot of a lot of species um, in marine life. Um, so why do you think that the ocean conservancy should be taken as seriously in, in the ocean conservation in general? Do you think there's still time, some time to turn things around? Yeah, without a healthy ocean, um, everything else is going to fall apart. Um, I think the ocean kind of gets put in the back of people's thoughts. For a long time, we're all concerned about trees and what's happening on land. Um, but what happens in the ocean is super important as it is a key basis. Um, and even what happens on land affects that. Runoff is one thing when we use a lot of pesticides and things on the land and then it rains that runs off into the ocean and that will kill coral, that can kill other invertebrate species and fish species, um, which then has a triple effect into then like a manta ray can get um, a bioacclimation of harmful chemicals in their bodies and whatnot. Um, so definitely should be taken seriously, but I think because we don't see what's happening in the ocean, as much as we see what's happening on land, that's why it's kind of hard for people to really consider it. Um, there's definitely still some time to turn things around. Um, the biggest way to do that, again, like I said, is voting and advocacy. Um, that's how we'll really see a big change, but of course, also try in your own daily life. That, yeah, that's very important to keep in mind. Um, our actions affect a lot of the Earth's natural wildlife. Um, so you also work in killer whale conservation. Um, can you explain what threats your organization uh, work to protect whales from? Yeah, so I work with PNW Protectors and we are working on a project right now to restore part of the ecosystem in the Salish Sea. So um, mainly through kelp reforestation and then invasive species management with the sea urchin populations. And that's just um, there's a degradation to their natural habitat. We want to try and restore that. But one of the other big issues, like I said, was the Chinook salmon is that they're, they have a depleting food source. And so um, we are advocating a lot and pushing the governor of Washington to actually work to breach the dams. For the last few years, nothing has happened. Um, he instead has built an orca task force that put blame and pressure on the whale watching industry and are just putting more regulations on them, even though they are not the cause of the issue it's that the southern residents are starving um, so part like a big thing of what we do is raising awareness and also um, really putting a lot of pressure on the politicians in um, not only Washington but in Canada we have people on the Canadian side that do the same thing we write letters to Justin Trudeau and then also Governor Inslee and other um, military officials in Washington um, and also just raising awareness for what's wrong, like why these dams aren't necessary because that's something people try and say is that the dams, so they must be necessary so we can't breach them. But they actually are costing the state money and they're not gaining any revenue. So there is no purpose to them. So just trying to um, raise awareness for that. Um, so we have also noticed that you have gained um, a following about your work on social media. So could you explain to us how your new platform has helped you promote awareness? Yeah, so um, just having a bigger audience helps as well. Um, so the more people that are able to see my content, the better, because it can even just, um, even like the pretty stuff where it's just very aesthetically pleasing can lead them to maybe look through my pages, um, go through my Instagram and see some of the bigger issues I raise awareness for. And sometimes um, my conservation content will not do as well as just like a pretty dive photo. Um, but as long as like one new person sees it or watches it, then I am happy because that's one new person that um, has that new awareness. And then I also get a lot of DMs asking questions. So that's helpful. I can have like one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to kind of like put a little bit of conservation in their ear. That's really great. Um... So you're also lead ambassador for women in ocean science. Can you tell us about your experiences with that organization and how it has helped to connect you to other people passionate about the same field? Yeah, so I'm officially passing my mantle of that role on to one of my friends because lead ambassadors, um, we have one for college, that's the goal, 
and we are in charge of like doing an emotion science in our school and putting events together and just trying to build that community um, and network for each other. So that's um, one of the best parts about the organization is building a network and that's the most important thing in marine science really is having a good network. Um, it also just connects like I learn about what other people are doing. I've made friends in other countries um, and built my network that if I maybe go to Australia one day, I know girls there now that are like, oh, stay with me or come out and help me with my project or just come hang out and look at our beautiful wildlife. Um, that's awesome. And it, it's just like a great platform in general to um, bring some women in STEM together. Yeah, I think that's great. Um... So also you are a student at BYU Hawaii and there you assist in marine science research projects. Um, so we noticed you work specifically or as one of your things in uh, ecosystem restoration. So what areas in particular have you and your team studied? Yes, yeah, so the majority of what I've worked on at my university have been genetic research. So we've done genetic um, research and population research with a coral species that we're working to identify here. And then another project is with one of my other professors, and it's bonefish and hawkfish, hawkfish research. Um, and we do genetic testing and whatnot on those, and we will do um, tagging devices. I've also helped a few other friends with their own personal projects, and I've helped with um, a couple coral restoration projects here. So kind of dabbled. We all kind of dabble in a bunch of areas. I've also worked with cricket research, um, which was fun. It's like it was an animal behavior study which is always exciting for me to do animal behavior. Um, so yeah, a lot of us, because our university is so small, those of us who are involved in the research project kind of get passed around to some of the teachers, um, which is good because we get a lot of different experiences with different species. Like I've now worked with fish and I've worked with coral and then I've also worked with bugs. And so then we've also done part of our projects here is all the students are involved in ecosystem restoration here on on Oahu with um, ripping out of invasive species plants and we will go and plant more native and endemic species to try and rebuild up the natural habitat that we kind of destroyed when coming to Hawaii. Um, so what was one of your favorite research projects and why? Um, that is a good one. I really have enjoyed the coral research, I think because I it was more enjoyable because I was able to get in the water, not a lot, but more, but also just noticing now that coral species, it's really small and it's a soft coral, which isn't common here um, in Hawaii. Most of our corals are um, rock corals, so they just look kind of meh. Um, but these ones are tiny little octocorals and they, um, they're they soft. And so they just look, they're just like, they kind of look like purple moss on some areas. And so we'll go out, um, and we'll go to different areas on the island throughout the year and watch because um, we have a bunch of hypotheses about how they um, will find place, like essentially find a place to live throughout the year. Um, and then we also have been able to take really cool pictures of them to like update the species um, for research because part of what we're doing is just updating what we know about this um, species of coral. So it's just been fun to see like this tiny little organism um, and learn more about it and be able to share a lot about that with our other students. Um, so can you tell us some more about some of the other organizations you're involved in, for example, Ocean Mimic and uh, One Ocean Conservation? And how have these experiences shaped your views about ocean conservation? Yeah, so um, I work with, like a bunch of different organizations and I think it's just kind of interesting because they each have a focus on different areas. So like Ocean Mimic is a push for using more sustainable materials in our dive and just outdoor wear. So our swimsuits, trying to source them a bit more sustainably. And then One Ocean Conservation, um, I was over organizing beach cleanups, which was awesome, um, but we don't do that right now because of COVID. <laughs> so it's kind of a bummer, but it, that was really fun just because um, I was able to do a lot of outreach with locals and even people who just came for vacation would sometimes see um, we'd post to be like hey beach clean up this weekend so sometimes guests would come that have, are just here for like a week and we'd be able to show them the like plastic crisis that we're facing and they would also get a help um, then I've also related to that worked with sustainable coastlines of Hawaii um, they're another awesome organization 
Jason Momoa has like backed them up and donated a ton of money to them. They're awesome. Um, and it just puts into perspective um, a lot of like the plastic crisis that we're facing because we really see that here in Hawaii, um, which I didn't know about before I came here. I didn't know there was anything wrong with plastic. And neither did a lot of my family and friends back on the mainland. And so being able to like share that has um, changed my views, but also their views and their experiences. And I've gotten calls from like people that I know, but not like my friend's parents. They're like, so my son got married and he didn't use any plastic. And they just called me and told me that. I was like, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so that's, that's really awesome. <laughs> Um, so why do you think more people should pursue a career in marine science? Like what advice would you give to those interested? Um, so why would be because we have so much to learn about the ocean. Um, we've spent more money exploring the moon and just outer space in general than we have our own oceans, which are right next to us. So there's so much potential and it would be great to see just a fraction more of that money put into what we have on our own planet that we have haven't even discovered most of yet it feels like um, and I know my biggest advice is for people to just work hard um, and I know a lot of people will say like there's no jobs in this field but I've looked through job boards there are jobs just one of the biggest issues is people just go to school and they don't get experiences while they're in college or university um, so when you go to if you're going to study marine science or any environmental science or really anything to be getting experiences while you're there. It can either be a job, like maybe working for your school's department, it can be volunteering, um, just it can be internships, it can be what honestly whatever, but as long as you have more than just the grades on your resume, that really can put you ahead and um, make you a more competitive candidate um, in the field. And it also is just more fun to get involved while you're in college. Um. So can you tell us a little bit about your work for with writing grants for marine biology NGOs and how do those work and how these help you um, help organizations better spread their message? Yeah, so grant writing can be fairly common, especially in conservation work. So if anyone's wanting to work in conservation grant writing, um, you'll either be involved in writing for it or coming up with stuff to put in a grant. Um, it's very tedious work you want to be as thorough as possible because you're basically just asking either the government organizations for money to fund a project. Sometimes you can, you can get grants to go get your PhD too. So sometimes you're writing about why someone should help you get your PhD, why your research is important. Um, but um, it puts my minor to good use, which is nice. I'm an English minor, um, but I've been able to um, grow a skill which is NGO, like I can now put on resumes that I am an NGO writer and I have experience doing that, which is, it looks great. Um, it's something that takes a bit to just kind of learn, but once you learn it, I really think it's um, very good for people to have that skill in their pocket, but it's helping um, these organizations that I do it for, it's helping us kind of spread um, a really thorough message because grants are able to really get into depth about why we founded it information um, our budget plan that's like the most difficult part about a grant is you have to go through your entire budget you have to like how much you're asking for and then break it down how you'll use every cent of that money um, which also just makes you think more about your own project and the responsibility you have um, so that's been great and then I also just get to have closer relationships with these organizations that I love because they're entrusting me with a lot of vital information um, and I also get to like ask really personal questions like why did you found this like I really need to know for this grant um, so I kind of get to hear a lot more of the backstory from their perspective instead of just like a post on Instagram I'm talking to these founders which is awesome and um, really puts in a lot of perspective that's really great um, so I know that you just talked about what advice you would have for people interested in marine science um, but what advice would you give to like someone in high school um, who just wants to get involved with conservation efforts. Yeah, um, so if they wanted to get involved in conservation for like a job and like go to university for a conservation degree, um, a lot of people ask me how to get involved in high school. Um, look into any kind of conservations in your own area. They don't need to be ocean conservations. There's a ton of 
conservation and environmental work in every part of the world to try to get involved in that. They usually will have volunteers that they'll need. Um, so just reach out, fill it out online. That's honestly one a really great way to help. Um, but also do well in school, especially if you're wanting to pursue a degree. That's how you get into school. And then once you're in school again, it's getting involved, it's building that network. And that is like the most important thing you can do um, to kind of get ahead and into this field. That's really great. Uh, thank you. Um, that's all of the questions we have for you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right.